thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, indeed, uh, I'm very pleased to be here, uh, and I always enjoy to be here, and also I enjoy to be in the city of Berlin. And my presentation, is, as you can see, is about Shell. And to be more specific, it's about corporate social responsibility and Shell, and then specific on the case of the Niger Delta. Uh, my presentation will focus on the main question, which is to what extent is Shell performing corporate social responsibility in the Niger Delta? And this is the following outline I have. First, uh, we are going to look at, uh, shortly at the definitions of corporate social responsibility. Then the Niger Delta, where Shell mainly uh, is situated. And then um, the connection between Shell and corporate social responsibility in the region. Uh, of course, we're going to look at some controversies as well. Um, at the end, I will try to provide a solution. And of course, at the end, there is a conclusion. And basically, I chose this topic because uh, there is a lot of news about Shell and also in particular actually in the Niger Delta. And I think this area uh, is very good to picture corporate social responsibility because it's um, if it works, you see that it works. If it's not works, uh, you will very definitely see that it not works. So um, let's start with the definition. Main definition is uh, from the business dictionary. And it's um, a company's sense of responsibility towards the community and the environment, both ecological and social, in which it operates. Companies express this citizenship, one, through their waste and pollution reduction processes, two, by contributing educational and social programs next to their business activities, and three, by earning adequate returns on the employed resources. Um, to follow up on this, like in the 70s, there was um, Professor Friedman who wrote in the uh, New York Times in 1970 about that so corporate social responsibility is basically um, focusing or is a way to focus, focusing for a business to maximize profits and also to focus on the stakeholders. Um, uh, the stakeholders, and not focusing on the social goal behind the business. So it's basically to get more profit and focus on the stockholders. And there is, of course, some challenging definitions against that, which uh, has been written down by Mick Williams and Siegel. And he says that actions that appear to further some social good beyond the entrance of the firm, and but it. It's mostly acquired by law, otherwise it would not happen. So you have on the one hand just business interests, and on the other hand you have definition you say there is indeed something more than only getting more profit. There is uh, indeed business have a responsibility to the rest of the world, and we should focus on that. As we move on in this presentation, I want you to think like, what is Shell doing? Is it more of uh, going for the profit, or is it indeed really establishing a better world in the Niger Delta? So let's move on to the region. First, Nigeria, the country, and oil. Since the 20th century, mostly in the 60s of the 20th century, Nigeria became dependent on oil. And even in the 80s, it was totally dependent on oil. So oil and Nigeria are unseparated. And although they have a lot of oil and you would say a lot of wealth, this wealth is very uneven allocated through the country. And where the oil is situated is in the Delta region, which you will see here the colored states of the Nigerian country, the south. There is where the oil is mainly situated. And of course, there is also where Shell is situated. That brings us to the Niger Delta. And these are some general data about the Niger Delta, and which gives you a picture also about the problems who, uh, which are there. Uh, it has kind of the size of Portugal, but it's 50% swamp, 
and also mangrove. So it's a very tough, uh, th those are very tough conditions to work in and also for the, for the people who live there. Um, the population is 31 million, which is 23% of the total population, and it's, this is growing, 3.1% per year. Uh, population density is very high, one of the highest in the world, 265 per square kilometer. And because people are very poor on the countryside, urbanization takes place here as well as in many other parts in the world. Um, but since people come into the city and since there's no economic growth whatsoever, um, they won't get a job and they will even come into a more negative spiral, which doesn't help. And so this is kind of the situation. So now let's move on to Shell and the Niger Delta, uh, the connection between those. As I already said, um, oil is very important to Nigeria. And of course, then Shell uh, plays also a very a key role in the Nigerian economy. Um, in 1958, it was the first private exploitation. And nowadays, it both exploits oil onshore and both offshore. In this presentation, we'll focus more on the onshore exploitation. If we talk about Shell and the Niger Delta, you should also focus on the Shell Petroleum Development Company of Nigeria, which shortly the SPDC which uh, is the operator of an unincorporated joint venture, uh, which consisted out of the NNPC. It's the uh, Nigerian National Petroleum Company, which has 55%. Shell has 30%. The TEPNG, which is a subsidiary of Total, the Total Company, which maybe some of you know, and which 10% in Ahib or Egypt is 5%. And the production capabilities of the SBDC is capable to produce one million barrels a day. And now, more the impact, the economic impact. Basically, the largest economic impact which Shell has are through royalties and taxes. Um, the SBDC has contributed about 42 billion to the government in the past five years, from 2000. Uh, 2008 to 2012. So, and federal government receives about 95% of the revenue after costs from the SPDC uh, joint venture. Also, because other economic benefits are that um, SPDC creates 6,000 jobs directly, which have to do with Shell direct, directly, it works, and 20,000 indirectly. And most of them are Nigerian, so it actually provides work for the Nigerians. Although, of course, when you see the large population in the Niger Delta, it's of course uh, not that many, but it, it is some. <clears throat> um, furthermore, next to this, the Shell uh, company, or SPDC, awarded contracts to Nigerian companies worth of almost 2.4 billion in 2012. And this is 64% of all the contracts which are awarded in 2012. And furthermore, the um, Shell also uses local manufactured goods and services, and which also creates more jobs. Spreading the wealth, the four producing oil states, which we saw on the map, four of them they produce. They have 10% of the population and they earn uh, a third of the revenue. And this is, of course, kind of a bad allocation. And Shell does saw this and they initiated and sponsored the Nigerian Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, which what it basically does is it focuses on where the money from the government goes to the different provinces and also where the money from the different uh, oil companies goes to the state. So it makes it more transparent. Although it, has a, it did make it more transparent, but after 50 years, it is not been, Shell has not been able to change the welfare level, and it's still, there is still a bad allocation. 
of the profits. So next to this economic influence, shall also, uh, so we're going to continue more to the social responsibility, focus more on community development. So the first thing Shell does is actively promotes projects in the Niger Delta, supports small businesses, agriculture training, education, healthcare. In 2012, Shell operations contributed over 178 million to the Niger Delta development mission. Um, this is required by law as well, so they, they need to do that. Um, the SPDC and the SNPCO, the SNEPCO, is the offshore uh, part of the shell, uh, paid 169 million of its profits into federal government education fund. And the total investment of the past five years, from 2000, again from 2008 to 2012, was 635 million. Also, SBDC provide running water in the region and invest in electricity. Uh, they build schools and award 3,000 secondary and university scholarship every year. Um, the SPDC is creating microcredit programs throughout the Niger Delta, and also it creates healthcare centers helping 250,000 people a year in the country. Um, the next thing we want to focus on is that they also created a new model of development in the Niger uh, Delta region which started in 2006, and it's called the Global Memoranda of Understanding. And this is basically um, gives communities a greater control on their own development, so they can pick their own way how they, where they want to go with their future. And so basically, on the first place are the interests of the community, and then the interests of the uh, funder. So, um, this is done in, with a secure multi-year funding and access uh, to development experts, so, which, is, which sounds quite nice, but of course, uh, it's hard to point out the results here, I think. And the communities identify their own needs, which I said, and they can also decide how their money is spent and how the projects are implemented. Now, let's turn to the controversies because this was this sounded very positive, and in a way, it is positive because Shell does do something about the uh, social environment there, and they try to uh, improve it. However, there are controversies, and they should not be denied. Uh, first of all, there is the environmental damage, which is. Um, said by some people is devastating. Uh, I want to give you an example. In 2006, there was a research done by the Niger Delta National Resource Damage Assessment and Restoration Project. And it's an independent team of UK scientists, American scientists, and also Nigeria scientists. They report, uh, that report noted that the Niger Delta was one of the most contaminated regions in the world where oil was uh, exploited. And also, this region is one of 10 most important uh, wetlands and marine ecosystems in the world. Furthermore, the effect of this environmental devastation is that, uh, of course, the people there who live there, which I say again, the dense population density is very high, people are poor, so people uh, 75% of the people rely on the waters of the uh, Niger Delta. And also, the fish who get contaminated, they swim not only in the Niger Delta, but they swim further in Western African countries. So it's not only the Niger Delta, but it's, uh, the problem is way bigger. And yeah, this is a big thing, and uh, it should not be denied. Then the, the second one is the Ogoni crisis, which I think, uh, which took place in 1995, which I think is a very uh, important controversy because it states both 
the environmental damage problem and the allocation problem of wealth. The Ogoni uh, tribe or the Ogoni people, they were frustrated about this environmental damage and also about the poorness, about this allocation. And they um, revolted against Shell and they occupied the uh, working areas of Shell and Shell had to pull back from the Niger Delta in the, in the 90s. But what happened is that the government of Nigeria uh, actually attacked the Ogondi tribes, the villages and everything, and, evenly, uh, and even the leader of the Ogoni tribe was eventually executed, which led to a lot of international uh, like astonishment, you could say. And this is a, bad, like a black page in the uh, oil history in Nigeria. Then the third one is gas flaring. Um, what gas flaring is, normally when you produce oil, there is, uh, you, there is some gas, like uh, you have oil and uh, the rest product is gas. So what you do normally is you put it back into the pipe or you use it for energy production. What happens in Nigeria, however, is that there is no, there's not that much of a demand for gas. So what they do is just burn it because they don't need it. And it's actually a lot what they burn. It's at least 12 billion cubic uh, meters of gas per year, which is on the second place after Russia. And this is not the gas you would find in your kitchen, clean gas. No, this is very poisoned gas, and it actually infects also the environment and the water with toxic compounds. And this also, of course, has an effect on the population as well. So, um, basically what happened with this gas flaring, the government tried to stop it, but um, Shell mostly uh, resisted this. They just take the fine, they paid it, and however, the last decade you could say that Shell is trying to stop this, and now, today, there you could say is like one, 100 gas flaring pipes are there. So, and then the final controversy, which I want to uh, pay a little more attention on, are the oil spills, because this is the biggest thing, I think. And uh, from 2008 to 2012, this is what Shell states, under a quarter of the oil that escaped from the SPDC facilities uh, was due to operational causes, such as human error or equipment failure. And the rest, which you see at the, at the bottom line, is uh, because of illegal theft and illegal refining. That uh, is 76%. Um, what Shell also does, the spill and causes, that's what they do since a couple of years. They put it on the website, they show where are the spills, they show how it comes, uh, the reason for it. And also, when it's because of operational damage, the shell compensates the damage uh, with the landowner. But of course, if there's sabotage or something else, shell doesn't compensate it. The sabotage, it's about these are also poor people, but it's not that they're just some small group of people. This is a very, uh, uh, these are very constructed in a very professional way. It's about 400,000 barrels of oil every day are thefted uh, and illegal refined in Nigeria. So this is a very big problem. But the, mainly the discussion is about how much is actually stolen or bunkered, this is the, the jargon, or, and how much is actually because of Shell's bad pipelines. And this is actually a discussion between the criticism and Shell. And so, Here's a report of 2013 on the oil spills at a glance of, of amnesty. Um, there have been more than 600 spills in the Niger Delta between January and September 2013, and more than 2,500 between 2008 and 2012. Of the ones in 2013, 471 were from Agip, and approximately 140 from Shell. 
Of those that took place in the period 2008-2012, between 788 and 1,000 were from Shell facilities, 1,690 from AGIP, and a small number from other operators. Companies, which I just said, blame most of these spills uh, on sabotage and theft of oil, but evidence shows, evidence which Amnesty has, that there's corrosion, it's equipment failure, and about other causes except from the, the, the theft. So, so basically, also what they say is the, the controlling of these pipelines and is done by Shell itself. So it's very hard to come into between the arguments of Shell. On the other hand, they try to become more uh, transparent. So we're now, possible solution is both sides, the criticism and the Shell, agree that there, there, there are hard circumstances and that there are problems in the Niger Delta that have to be dealt with. However, Shell is blaming the criminal groups and the illegal bunkering, which is the biggest problem. And on the other hand, Shell is the Amnesty International, for example, says that the upkeep is a problem, that Shell should do more to um, innovate its material and to keep it up better, to, to improve the upkeep. So a solution would be that not, which I just say, Shell controls the pipelines and their whole in industry, um, but that an independent organization would control this. So for example, uh, an organization of the UN. Conclusion. Go back to the question, to what extent is Shell performing corporate social responsibility in the Niger Delta? Uh, let's, if you still remember the uh, definition, the waste, the first, uh, first part of that definition was waste and pollution reduction, is that happening? Um, this is happening, but it still can be improved, can always be improved. Uh, second uh, part of the definition, social programs and educations. Uh, is that happening? These are provided, definitely, which we saw. Um, but still, of course, this can also be improved if you see uh, the situation in Nigeria. But there is a start, which is positive, I think. And three, adequate returns. Uh, are there adequate returns of the resources, for example, Nigeria gives, so for example, the oil? Are there adequate returns for that? And this is, of course, debatable. On the one hand, you saw the economic benefits, which is because of Shell. They have billions of dollars Nigeria earns through Shell. Um, but, of course, it goes to the government, and it's, it's not that good allocated. So. The, yeah, the returns are actually, do not spill over to the uh, local people. And that's, that's, I think, the biggest problem of this case. So this is my conclusion. And thank you for listening. And are there any questions? OK, I see already one question. Hello. Okay. So uh, I'm Brice from France. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, which I believe you managed to be like quite objective. I, I had a lot of things to, to ask. I uh, will try to, to summarize. Uh, first, uh, I think the biggest issue, uh, and you mentioned it, is water. So first question, what are your company clearly uh, does for water issues? And second, uh, secondly, uh, there are also a lot of reports uh, uh, from NGOs about corruptions. Um, what is, is your point of view, official, uh, or maybe, uh, I don't know, less official point of view about this? You also sp uh, talked about not spilling over uh, the wealth of uh, oil through population. And uh, I wanted to ask like, maybe a moral question. Don't you think it's also a duty for a, a big company like this to uh, try to improve the, the wealth and local population and also to, uh, uh, to make them work maybe with you, because it's maybe one of the, one of the biggest issue. It's because population not really taking part of the process, and that's why there's also all this uh, stealing problem from oil. So yes, I would look forward to hear your answer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question. Uh, the first one is 
what did, what did they done about water? The, an example is they provided uh, clean water wells in villages, so people have fresh water, fresh streaming water, which was not there before. This is an example I know about. For the rest, um, the, uh, about the second question, my personal opinion about the spillover. Corruption. The corruption. Yeah, the corruption is, of course, a big problem. Um, but it's hard to say where the, where the line is because the corruption, you could definitely say the government, uh, this kind of a fact is corrupt. And Shell has, like, has to cooperate with this government. But then you come in a kind of gray area. It's hard to see when Shell takes part in this corruption or not. Like, and what, they have to cooperate, but of course, it's also easy then to say that they are corrupt as well. On the other hand, uh, they also state that they uh, fight corruption and they admit actually that, um, that the, the, the revenue, which they also wanted to, to be more spilled over to the population, uh, they want to prove that as well. But of course, it's, it's very hard because the government has, of course, the last word uh, in, this, in these policies. So this is, uh, this is very difficult, actually. And then finally, my personal opinion about uh, the local, local population. Yeah, of course, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a very big issue. That's why I chose this topic as well. And it happens today. And it's a Western company. And uh, of course, I think we should all feel kind of responsible about these things which are happen every day, not only in the Niger Delta, but in a lot of places in the world. So, um, yeah, personally, I think what Shell does the last couple of years, they try to improve, which is good. Uh, but I think it's not yet enough. And we have, yeah, time will see what, what happens. I hope it will improve better. Hi, I'm Tarun from India. Uh, you said in your presentation that uh, due to operational inefficiencies from 2008 onwards, that uh, it has been blamed that the oil spillover is because of that. Is there no mechanism in check for that? Because that's a long period of time for the oil to be coming out and the damage to be happening for a period of time. And how do you possibly compensate for it? Because there is loss of oil, and mm. but there is loss in terms of many environmental damages to the African continent as well. Yes. So basically what I know, like first about the control, they do control it, like the, the pipelines. But Shell said it's, it's impossible because it's a very large area. As I said, it's, port, it's the size of Portugal. It's very hard to worry. It's very hard to see or hard to come at some times to these pipelines to control it. So uh, when there is theft or bunkering, uh, it happens and it's very hard to stop. Uh, but nevertheless, I think uh, the control of the pipelines is, or the management of the pipelines is, could be done better because there are also uh, spills just because of uh, that the pipelines are very old and so, so this should definitely improve. And how decomposition is done is when there is something happening, when there is a spill, um, farmers which have a production of, of X, they, uh, Shell will compensate for that, for what they lost in their uh, uh, production. But of course, this is very hard to see, to measure, and also, uh, like who is affected and who not. It's very hard to get to uh, make boundaries there. So they should uh, always compensate a lot of people, which, which they try to do, but it's, it's very hard where, where, where the line is. Yeah. So. Morning. My name is Yulia, and I'm from Ukraine. And uh, my first question is: um, 
Do you think if there are any cases of independent observers who see all of this exploitation and spills over, and whether they can influence actually what Shelley is doing, and not simply giving reports on all of those thousands of spills overs, but rather having some practical mm -hmm. impact on what is going on? This is first thing. And another thing, um, thinking about all of these educational and social projects, it gives an impression that they are just trying to cover exploitation of resources of the country. And, uh, making uh, some sort of likable image and good reputation in the country. So isn't it a sort of uh, colonization of present days, I would say? What would you think about it? Thank you. Yeah. Um, to, to start with that last point, you're actually think like the definition of Friedman is like it's about profit and it's not actually about helping the, uh, the environment at all. It's about the profit and it's about the company and about the stakeholders or the stockholders. So, yeah, this is an uh, interesting thing. You could say that. Nevertheless, although if it's only for the, uh, for the reasons for the company, for the profit of the company, it's still the social um, programs, they still have an effect on the, on the surrounding environment. They have an effect. They really help people. And yeah, th this has an effect. So even if your reason would be right, or your, yeah, your argument would be right, it still has a, a positive effect. And about the uh, colonization, modern colonization is, yeah, this is, of course, the, no, I don't think it's co modern colonization because it's, uh, it's, it's how our world now works. And I don't say this is a good world because you see what happens. Um, but it's definitely not colonization because there is no, uh, I don't, colonization has to do with state influence from the West. And I think multinationals are factors next to states. They should not be compared with states. They play even just as important role as states or even more important, but you cannot compare them, I think. So I, I will not, agree. I don't agree with that. And what is the first point you, you want to? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I see. yeah. So, like, Amnesty International is quite independent. So this is a, an example, but still the effect is kind of uh, low. Um, but that's why I said the UN. So it has to be a very broad basis of international countries. So, and this is also good because then other countries would see, okay, if this happens there, if the UN doesn't accept this, then we should also be careful. This, it will have a spillover effect, I think. So it needs to be supported by a very big international coalition. Yes. Uh, 